So the problem isn't failures on our part, sinning and struggling. And, you know, I have a question, I have a doubt, I can't figure this out. Why is God doing this to me? Everybody does that. Plenty of people in the Bible did that who are, you know, very obviously believers. And they're in the Hall of Faith, Hebrews 11. I mean, good grief. You know, that isn't the issue. Here's the key line. Here's the controversial line. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away. It's impossible to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Okay, this is a difficult passage. And it's really difficult. I'm going to click over to the Pillar New Testament commentary and just show you, again, try to summarize what the issues are here. And then I'm going to give you my two cents on it. It's difficult because it makes us uncomfortable. Now, I'll grant it's difficult because, you know, there are a couple of ways you can go with the interpretation. Okay, I'll, we, you know, we'll own that. But it's also difficult because we don't, especially American evangelicalism, is not used to entertaining even the question. It, it, it's uncomfortable with what the text says. And what I'm going to submit to you is that the text is going to be consistent here like it was in the two previous chapters. The issue is always keep believing. But, but the, 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 the question, the problem, the controversy is what, what about this impossible statement? So this is the Pillar New Testament commentary, and he, this is a nice summary of where you know, scholars land on this, or, or at least what the issues are, by Peter O'Brien. He says, the author finally rounds off the main verbal idea in his long sentence informing his listeners of what is impossible. It is impossible for those who have committed apostasy to be brought back to repentance. This is his translation. This difficult expression has been taken to mean that those who reject Christ's sacrifice have repudiated, quote, the only basis on which repentance can be extended. While this is true, Hebrews is making the point that it is impossible to restore someone to repentance. I'm going to stop there. I'm actually on that side of this question. I think that's what it does mean. And I'm going to object to his reasoning here, but just, just follow me. I do think that what's impossible, what, what the writer of Hebrews is saying here, look, it's essentially this. If you have someone who believes the gospel and then they turn from it. God has nothing else to offer. This is the only means of salvation, the work of Jesus. And if you reject that, there's really nothing else God can do or is going to do. This is it. So, you know, there is no possibility that any other means is going to come along. And so this person would have to, again, come back to the thing that he rejected. Now, what the commentator is saying here is the writer considers that, the coming back, the restoration, as an impossibility. I'm going to object to that in, in a moment, and I'll show you why. And I'm going to base it on, on an analogy, salvation analogy, to the Old Testament. We're keeping the Testaments consistent here. I'm going to show you a specific example where someone who was an Israelite who ostensibly, you know, would have said, I, you know, I'm a follower of Yahweh, and then apostatized, but came back. Okay, I'm going to show you a specific example there. Now, the subject, again, the, the, the commentator says, of the infinitive to restore to repentance is indefinite. Are other Christians or God the implied subject? In other words, is it impossible for Christians to do this, or is it impossible for God to do something? This restoration. The most satisfactory suggesting, this is where he lands, is that it doesn't have Christians in view. It's impossible for God to restore the apostate to repentance. So that's the part I'm objecting to. What is meant by this? It does not imply that God does not have the power to bring back an apostate, since he's the one for whom all things and through whom all things exist. And his word is able to shake the foundations of the universe. But, he says, what it means is that God may refuse to restore an apostate. He may just say no. Okay. You know, the analogy he uses is, you know, it's impossible for God to lie. God will never do that. There are things God chooses to not do. 
out of, out of the nature of his character. Now, not only do I think that, that this isn't a good argument because of God's character, but I'm going to show you, hopefully I have the, the verse, yeah, right here, Manasseh. Okay, Manasseh's repentance. Now, again, we don't know a whole lot about Manasseh, but we know Manasseh was the worst idolater to ever occupy the kingship in Israel. If there was a deity out there to worship, he did it. And he did it zealously. Cultic prostitution, I mean, moving, moving in phallic figurines into the Holy of Holies. I mean, Manasseh did everything imaginable to be an apostate, to turn from the faith of his fathers. Everything. There's just nothing left undone. But here you go. This is 2 Chronicles 33. Again, this is late in Manasseh's life. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, and they paid no attention. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria, who captured Manasseh with hooks, bound him with chains of bronze, and brought him to Babylon. And when he was in distress, he entreated the favor of the Lord his God. I mean, he knows where to turn. And he humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, he prayed to him and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that Yahweh was God. You can't get lower than Manasseh. You can't get farther okay, from God than Manasseh. So what I'm suggesting here is if God looks at the apostasy of Manasseh, and here's his prayer, that it's not impossible for God to hear the prayer of someone who has forsaken believing loyalty. Okay, I think we need to be consistent across the Testaments. Again, I, I go through all that basically to say that the New Testament, the New Testament does define salvation as believing loyalty. You believe in the work of Jesus exclusively. There is no other option. If you reject that, well, you're in a world of hurt because God isn't offering anything else. There is zero possibility there that something else will be offered to you. For, just forget it. This is the only means of salvation, the very thing that you've just rejected if you're an apostate. But I think we can say on the basis of not just Manasseh, I mean, there's going to be other, you know, there's a few handful of examples like this where God will hear the prayer of the sinner. He will hear the prayer of the apostate and will welcome you back. The lesson we should draw from this is don't get into this mess. Okay, don't stop believing. You cannot lose your salvation. You can't leave it somewhere. You, you, you can, losing salvation only makes sense if it can be earned or merited, and it can't. Salvation leaves you with only two choices. You believe, you embrace, or you reject. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is concerned about. It's not, you know, salvation, like I have here in the notes, salvation is believing loyalty. It's not believing perfection. Okay, we're going to sin. 1 John 1, 8 through 10. If we say we have no sin, we're a liar, you know. I mean, everybody sins. We get it. We know that. God knows it. Okay, you're not going to sin away your salvation. You're either going to believe and keep believing, or you're going to reject. Those are the only two choices, both in your heart and in the cosmos. Those are the two choices. There's nothing in between. There's, it has nothing to do with, with works or merit or anything like that. So the problem isn't failures on our part, sinning and struggling and, you know, I have a question, I have a doubt, I can't figure this out. Why is God doing this to me? Everybody does that. Plenty of people in the Bible did that who are, you know, very obviously believers, and they're in the Hall of Faith, Hebrews 11. I mean, good grief. You know. That isn't the issue. You're not in the Hall of Faith, Hebrews 11, if you turn to another God. You're not there. You could really screw up a lot and be there. But if you turn to another God, you're not there. And that is the issue. What the writer of Hebrews is worried about is unbelief 
i.e. rejecting salvation, rejecting the King, rejecting the Savior. He knows that, that, that we're believing now, but there, are, there could be people you know, among our, our group that just bail. They just say, I don't believe this anymore. This is why the scripture says what it says. Now, again, I don't, I don't care how that fits into your system. Okay, I really don't. We don't need systems. We need to pay attention to the text and we need to be consistent across the Testaments. That's what we need. 